The curtain rises on the first scene of Act Two. It is early next morning. A pale shaft of sunlight shines down the steps, but candles still burn in the dark corner where Osborne and Raleigh are at breakfast. Mason has put a large plate of bacon before each and turns to go as Trotter comes down the steps, whistling gaily and rubbing his hands. Trotter opens the scene with food characteristically on his mind. What a lovely smell of bacon! And, in an exchange with Mason, provides another moment of light relief as they have a verbal jousting match over the amount of fat and lean meat in the bacon and the desirability, or not, of lumps in the porridge. Note how once more Mason bats away Trotter's sarcastic complaints by appearing to take him seriously when he asks about the porridge. Lumpy, I suppose. Yes, sir. Quite nice and lumpy. Well, take the lumps out of mine. And just bring you the gravy, sir. Very good, sir. This isn't the first time that there's been an undercurrent of friction between Trotter and Mason. If you remember, in Act One, Trotter's attempt at sarcasm over the toughness of the cutlet falls flat as Mason refuses to rise to the bait. What's causing this tension between them? Could it just be that Trotter is more overtly critical of the food and Mason's culinary skills, and this is what gets Mason's back up? Or does Trotter's remark as Mason leaves give us a hint of something more? Mason goes out. Trotter looks after him suspiciously. You know, that man's getting familiar. In other words, Trotter feels that Mason is not treating him with the respect that he, as a superior officer, is due. We've been led to believe in Act 1, from Trotter's way of speaking, that Sheriff intends him to be seen, in stark contrast to officers such as Stanhope, Raleigh, Osborne and Hibbert, who have been parachuted into the officer class due to their upper-class public school backgrounds, as a working-class man who has worked his way up to the rank of an officer, from being just one of the men. And he actually confirms this a few lines later on. Once upon a time, Trotter was of the same rank as Mason, and they would have conversed as equals, so it's no wonder, then, that Mason perhaps feels resentful at having to be deferential to someone he regards essentially as just the same as him. The conversation continues between Trotter and Osborne as they discuss Mason's abilities as a cook, and Trotter reminisces about the cook they had when he was in the ranks, or before he was promoted to officer class. Note how he seems to talk in a very heartless way about the cook's fate. Lucky for us, one day he set himself on fire making the tea. He went home pretty well fried. Did Mason get that pepper? What's shocking to the audience is that not only is his choice of language callous in describing the man who must have had nasty burns as being pretty well fried, and that this was lucky because it meant a replacement cook, but his tone is also casual and dismissive as he's able to instantly switch his attention to the missing pepper. Trotter, however, isn't otherwise depicted as a monster and this is perhaps intended to communicate how the men needed to protect themselves psychologically from the pain and trauma they witnessed in order to continue to function. Stanhope's safety blanket is whiskey. For Trotter, it seems to be food and emotional detachment. Trotter's reaction is also perhaps a measure of the desensitisation the men underwent, and the relativity of the pain and trauma they suffered during the war. In comparison to other deaths and injuries he has had experience of, this probably seems to him relatively minor. As Trotter continues to eat his breakfast, talk turns to what is going on outside, and tension and anticipation mount as we sense we are in a period of calm before the storm. He tells Osborne that he doesn't like the look of things a bit. It's too damn quiet. You can bet your boots the Bosch is up to something. The big attack's soon, I reckon. I don't like it, Uncle. 
past the jam. Note how Sheriff successfully captures the strangeness of their existence here through the juxtaposition of the stress of waiting for an attack where silence is something to be feared with the mundanity of their existence in the dugout as they observe the social niceties of passing the jam. Trotter then recounts how he and Raleigh came in from duty the previous night to find a drunken Stanhope sitting on that bed drinking a whisky. He looked as white as a sheet. God, he looked awful. He'd drunk the bottle since dinner. I said, hello, and he didn't seem to know who I was. Uncanny, wasn't it, Raleigh? There's a sense that Raleigh's education has well and truly begun. The way he responds to Trotter's comments with a dejected yes, with lowered head, communicates that he is clearly upset by the change he has seen in Stanhope. The blurred lines of Stanhope's and Raleigh's relationship are evident as Trotter reveals that he just said, better go to bed, Raleigh, just as if Raleigh'd been a school kid. Osborne, ever the diplomat, takes the opportunity to change the subject as he remarks that it'll be quite warm soon, which sparks a conversation about home life. We learn that there is more to Trotter than food after all, as he reveals an interest in gardening and a pride over his eight-foot Oliok, a photo of which he keeps in his pocket case. Note in another subtle observation of class difference, the contrast between Trotter's regimented suburban garden, with its little grass plot in front with flower borders, geraniums, lobelia and calceolaria, you know, red, white and blue, and Osborne's more natural countryside rockery, which he planted with wild primroses and things like that dug up from a nearby wood. This detail about their gardens also underscores how the war wrenched ordinary people away from their lives, families and homes, and threw them into extraordinary and bewildering circumstances. This is further reflected in Trotter's anecdote about when he and the men from his company thought that a funny sweet smell was phosgene gas, a chemical weapon that caused the lungs to fill with water and in large enough doses was fatal. Until Trotter spotted that it was a blinking may tree, all out in bloom, growing beside the path. We did feel a lot of silly poops, putting on gas masks because of a damn may tree. This story serves to highlight how the men are living on their wits the entire time, where one false move or delayed deployment of a gas mask can mean death and how their new reality has altered the way in which they relate even to the natural world around them, where the innocent fragrance of a flowering tree is enough to make them fear for their lives. Trotter exits to return to duty in the trench, leaving Osborne and Raleigh alone. Osborne lives up to his nickname Uncle, as he asks Raleigh how he has found his first night in the trenches. The subject of the passing of time is brought up again as Raleigh observes, I feel I've been here ages. He goes on to remark, using words that will take on tragic significance later, that he can't imagine the end of six days here. Osborne reassures him that the time will pass as they have done twelve hours already. Raleigh's question that the German front line is only about 70 yards, isn't it? leads Osborne to compare this distance to the breadth of a rugger field and initiates a conversation about Osborne's sporting career, playing for the Harlequins and for England. Raleigh's naivety and propensity for hero worship are once more in evidence as, clearly impressed and thrilled, he can't understand why Osborne doesn't want to tell everyone about it. Osborne then proceeds to tell the story, in response to Raleigh's comment that the Germans are really quite decent, aren't they? Of how, when they were up at Wipers, we had a man shot when he was out on patrol, and the Germans enabled them to rescue him, when they could, instead, have easily killed them all. But when our men began dragging the wounded man back over the rough ground, a big German officer stood up in their trenches and called out, Carry him! And our fellow stood up and carried the man back, and the German officer fired some lights for them to see by. Of course, Osborne observes, next day we blew each other's trenches to blazes. 
Raleigh's simplistic response to the fact that the soldiers were saved one day only to be shot at the next, that it all seems rather silly, doesn't it? Is a classic example of the proverb, out of the mouths of babes, oft times come gems which means that the young and innocent are often unexpectedly wise. In other words, it is his naivety that allows him to grasp and put into words an essential truth, one that Sheriff has been demonstrating since the curtain was first raised, that war is both absurd and futile, as we are capable of acts of the greatest humanity and inhumanity simultaneously. Stanhope enters and Riley leaves to continue writing his letter home. Note how the contrast between Trotter's opening remark, what a lovely smell of bacon, and Stanhope's, what a foul smell of bacon, communicates the level of his hangover and signals a change in mood. The talk switches from the philosophical to the practical and the vulnerability of the men's position becomes clear as Stanhope and Osborne discuss the condition of the wire that runs all along the front. Osborne remarks that it's very weak at present, while Stanhope complains that every company leaves it for the next one to do. There's great holes blown out weeks ago. Not only has he arranged for two wiring parties to go out that night to strengthen it, but that the next night we'll wire ourselves right in. If this attack comes, I'm not going to trust the companies on our sides to hold their ground. The tension mounts once more, as Stanhope reveals that, in a conversation with the colonel, he's found out that a German prisoner has let slip the big attack is set for the 21st, or, in other words, the second dawn from now. It's now no longer a matter of if, but when. Then it'll come while we're here. Yes, it'll come while we're here, and we shall be in the front row of the stalls. Oh well. Note how Stanhope uses a metaphor relating to the theatre, which usually describes the seats in the house where you get the best view of the stage, to ironically comment on the fact that they will bear the brunt of the attack. While Osborne's response is characteristically understated and fatalistic. We also learn that, When the attack comes, the men will be pretty much on their own, as we can't expect any help from behind. We're not to move from here. We've got to stick it. They are to be, to all intents and purposes, a human shield. There is now, for obvious reasons, a more pointed focus on the passing of time, although Sheriff modulates the tone by introducing some vicious dark humour. Stanhope spots Trotter's chart, asking Osborne, What's this extraordinary affair? When Osborne responds that it is Trotter's plan to make the time pass by, he works out just how long they have until the attack. Nearly nine o'clock now. Twenty-four till nine tomorrow. Twelve until nine at night. That's thirty-six. Nine till six next morning. That's forty-five altogether. What are you going to do? asks Osborne. At the end of the 45th circle, I'm going to draw a picture of Trotter being blown up in four pieces, responds Stanhope with bitter relish. Comments about Trotter lacking imagination lead the conversation back to more philosophical matters, as Stanhope reveals that the extreme psychological stress that the war has put him under has affected his own imagination and the way he sees the world and his existence in it. He confesses, Whenever I look at anything nowadays, I see right through it. It's a habit that's grown on me lately, to look right through things and on and on, till I get frightened and stop. And do you ever get a sudden feeling that everything's going farther and farther away, till you're the only thing in the world? And then the world begins going away, until you're the only thing in the universe, and you struggle to get back and can't. Note the hesitancy in his speech shown through dashes as he tries to articulate his loneliness, alienation, detachment and existential angst. Note that throughout this exchange Osborne tries to distract him by downplaying and dismissing his worries. 
Stanhope is not so easily diverted, however, as even remarks he makes about the sunrise lead him to comment on the sight of the Bosch trenches and right beyond, just an enormous plain, all churned up like a sea that's got muddier and muddier till it's so stiff that it can't move. The simile he uses here to describe the plain can perhaps be interpreted as a metaphor for the progress of the war itself, to suggest the loss of the sense of what they are really fighting for, communicated by the adjective muddier, as well as the sense of futility and stalemate, communicated by the way in which it is so stiff it can't move. Clearly feeling exposed after having revealed his anxieties, Stanhope calls for more whisky, and Osborne, in a bid to change the subject and the atmosphere, refers to a show at the Hippodrome that's been referred to in a magazine. This leads Osborne to talk more about his home life, in which he doesn't have time to go to shows. In learning that he's not only a husband, but also a father of two young boys, Sheriff succeeds in making him a much more three-dimensional character, allowing us to care more about him and so empathise with him. The irony that he is unable to escape the war, even when at home, because his two youngsters made me help in a tin soldier battle on the floor, allows us to see the innocent games played by the children in a new light. Not only does it illustrate how the myth was perpetuated, that fighting and killing was an heroic adventure, but the way in which he reveals... I wish I knew how to fight a battle like those boys of mine. You ought to have seen the way they lured my men under the sofa and mowed them down. Also foreshadows Osborne's own death in Act 3, Scene 1. The conversation then turns first to duties and then to Raleigh's writing of the letter, where Stanhope's paranoia that Raleigh will write something about him to Madge and that his cover will be blown is revealed. We learn that he is still, even in the cold light of day, intent on abusing his powers of censorship. Osborne tries to dissuade him, but Stanhope is convinced that Raleigh feels nothing but contempt for him. One thing a boy like that can't stand is a smell that isn't fresh. He looked at me as if I'd hit him between the eyes, as if I'd spat on him. Raleigh enters with his letter, and tension mounts as Stanhope reveals that he mustn't seal the envelope as the letter has to be censored first. Raleigh's reaction, his stuttering nervousness indicated by the repetition and dashes, seemed to confirm Stanhope's and our worst fears. Oh, I... I didn't realise that. He stands embarrassed, then gives a short laugh. I... I think... I'll just leave it then. He unbuttons his tunic pocket to put the letter away. Stanhope, however, cannot let this go. Not only must he check the contents of the letter for his own peace of mind, but he must also stamp his authority on Raleigh. There's an inevitable confrontation, as Raleigh refuses to hand over the letter and Stanhope has to resort to physical aggression. Stanhope clutches Raleigh's wrist and tears the letter from his hand. Raleigh is flabbergasted at Stanhope's overreaction. His shock, apparent from the way he falls back on appealing to their previous relationship as school friends. All a frustrated Stanhope can do is harshly reject once and for all the terms upon which they used to know each other. Don't Dennis me. Stanhope's my name. You're not at school. Go and inspect your rifles. As Raleigh leaves, Osborne cannot help but express his shock at Stanhope's behaviour. Good heavens, Stanhope. Note how the dynamic between Stanhope and Osborne now shifts, as Stanhope, in his frustration, seeks to assert his superiority over the mild-mannered Osborne and shatters the feeling of comfortable intimacy that the two have shared in the play up until this point. Look here, Osborne, I'm commanding this company. I ask for advice when I want it. When it comes down to it, however, Stanhope's moral character gets the better of him. The same sense of what is right that doesn't allow him to go off sick is what prevents him from reading the letter after all. Oh God, I don't want to read the blasted thing. They come to a compromise, where Osborne suggests that he look through it instead. He reads out the section that refers to Stanhope. 
he, the Sergeant Major, said that Dennis is the finest officer in the battalion and the men simply love him. He hardly ever sleeps in the dugout. He's always up in the front line with the men, cheering them on with jokes and making them keen about things, like he did the kids at school. I'm awfully proud to think he's my friend. It appears that the real reason Raleigh didn't want Stanhope to see the letter was because he was embarrassed about the praise he had heaped on him. It's clear that he's decided to preserve the heroic myth about Stanhope and has regaled his sister with all the nice things the men have said about him. Osborne asks him if he should stick the envelope down. The scene ends on a sombre and quiet note after the high drama of the confrontation between the men. Stanhope is suitably ashamed of his actions and feels worse about himself, if that's even possible, communicated by the way he sits with lowered head. He murmurs something that sounds like, yes please. Note how Sheriff communicates his dark mental state as he rises heavily and crosses to the shadows by Osborne's bed. While in contrast, the sun is shining quite brightly in the trench outside. Thanks for watching. If you have any questions, please let me know in the comments section below and I'll do my best to answer them. Don't forget to subscribe to my channel for more videos on English language topics and exam techniques and English literature texts.